But we begin tonight with the manic, bizarre, and frankly childish fanboying of Donald Trump, as illustrated by ultimate fanboy Elon Musk, literally jumping up and down on stage with Trump during a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. It was not just weird and meme-worthy, sparking hilarious online monikers like Dork Maga and Two Live Coup, but also ominous, given some of the frankly alarming things Musk has been saying. But when you look at the people backing Trump, some of the most noticeable ones, notable ones, I should say, are steeped in this precise moment. I, Nelson Hodesata Mandela, do hereby swear to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. That moment in South Africa when Nelson Mandela became president, giving hope to people not just in South Africa but around the world. An anti-apartheid activist and former political prisoner inaugurated as president of South Africa just four years after the end of apartheid. But for Afrikaners, meaning South Africans of European descent, it was a moment of panic, an official end of racial segregation, a policy that benefited them and only them, despite them comprising less than 10 percent of the population, by separating the minority white population and designating areas and activities prohibited to the black indigenous Africans who comprised 80 percent of the population. All white enclaves flourished under segregation and anti-black government propaganda. Think Jim Crow America. All I want is my, my, my churches must be white, my schools must be white, and my residence area should be white also. And while some Afrikaners welcomed the end of apartheid, many others fled in fear of black power. It was known as the white exodus. Some of MAGA's most significant backers were teenagers or very young adults when apartheid was eradicated. The Financial Times ticks them off. We have Elon Musk, who lived in South Africa until he was 17. David Sachs, the venture capitalist who left as a child and who has become a fundraiser for Donald Trump and a troll of Ukraine. Peter Thiel, an early Trump backer who spent years of his childhood in South Africa and Namibia, where his father was involved in uranium mining as part of the apartheid regime's drive to acquire nuclear weapons. And a lesser known Paul Ferber, a South African software developer and tech journalist living near Johannesburg, who has been identified by two teams of forensic linguists as the originator of the QAnon conspiracy, an allegation Ferber denies. All of these men, their formative experiences in apartheid South Africa. Now, we in America are facing a moment when our politics are turning into their politics. MAGA is sounding more and more like the old Afrikaner parties, ranting about low birth rates, going after immigration and portraying immigrants of color as violent savages. The idea that democracy will end if their white male patriarch is not elected. They're going so far as to lie about the opposing party, about whether the Biden-Harris administration is actually helping people in a hurricane, or lying and claiming disaster relief funds are being diverted to help undocumented immigrants. Lies, lies, all lies. And let's not forget their overarching lie about climate change being a hoax. Even as Hurricane Milton strengthened from a tropical storm to a Category 5 hurricane in just over a day, part of a trend of rapidly intensifying storms fueled by the climate crisis. But instead of putting their energy toward helping those in need, these Republicans are looking to terrify people with racist, dehumanizing lies about Haitians or Venezuelans, and Trump's now thrown in people from the Congo. The point is to terrify white voters and vulnerable voters of color into running into the arms of the autocrat, Trump, the only one who can save them from the savages. It is the Afrikaning of American politics, which should alarm us greatly, given the brutality, fascism, and racism of the apartheid era, and how right-wing Afrikaners like Elon Musk may have been shaped by growing up and coming of age during the institutionalized oppression of black people and its abrupt, ignominious end. The Financial Times notes how Musk warned in 2023 about potential genocide of white people in South Africa, 
Trump's recent claim about American girls being raped and sodomized and murdered by savage criminal aliens preyed on similar white fears. It is far from a coincidence that this is happening as Democrats are fielding a black presidential candidate for the third time in five elections. And why the leader of the Republicans is now an extremist known for enabling white supremacists and who is reviving race science as part of the discourse, as he did again in an interview today on conservative commentator Hugh Hewitt's podcast. You know, now a murderer, I believe this, it's in their genes. And we got a lot of bad genes in our country right now. And there you have it. Trump's long fascination with genes and bloodlines just got a lot creepier and Nazier with the claim that brown people have the murder gene. Joining me now is Adam Serwer, staff writer for The Atlantic, and Olivia Troy, former Homeland Security and counterterrorism advisor to Mike Pence and member of Republicans for Harris. Thank you both for being here. Adam, I do want to start with you because there is, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of read this, I read this, you know, Financial Times piece and I had this aha moment, you know, because uh, I wrote a book in which I interviewed a, a, a white South African professor and he labeled this very thing, that, that you had the Afrikaner, right-wing Afrikaner Nationalist Party in 2012 warn American Republicans that if they didn't get a handle on it, then this country would be like South Africa. And he directly said Republicans need to turn Turn themselves into an open white interests party. And voila, here comes Trump doing exactly that with a bunch of South African, African or former South Africans uh, at his back. What do you think? I think that the race science subtext, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that race science has been the subtext of a lot of Republican arguments. Uh, this idea, you know, that Trump sort of almost made text in that Hugh Hewitt interview uh, that there is a natural genetic hierarchy of human beings with white people at the top and people who are not white at the bottom. And he didn't say, he, he came very close to saying that in that Hugh Hewitt interview. He didn't quite say it explicitly, but this is an idea that has grown more popular sort of in the undercurrent of uh, conservative, what you, you might describe as conservative intellectualism. Uh, in terms of the, the books that they're reading, the ideas that they're toying with. And so it's not really surprising to see Trump express it. Um, it it's disturbing. Um, yeah. But this has been percolating in right-wing circles for, for a while, unfortunately. Yeah, I, let, me, let me just let him, let him express it. Here he is. This is Trump in Butler, Pennsylvania, talking about the enemy from within. I always say there's an enemy from within and there's an outside enemy. And if you're smart, the outside enemy is not going to be a problem. Russia, China, North Korea, we're not going to have a problem if you have a smart president. If you have, if you have not such a smart president, then it's a problem. But we have an enemy from within, which I think is much more dangerous than the outside enemy. We stand on the verge of the four greatest years in the history of our country. And the not-so-smart president, of course, he's implying is Kamala Harris, because as he said before, she was born not smart, that he's got this race science view toward her, that she, the way he's saying it, the same way he talked about Barack Obama, that they cannot possibly be the leader of a country, they cannot possibly be intelligent. I mean, he's just saying it straight out, Olivia, and this is now... This is the policy position of the Republican Party. Um, it's all about replacement theory and fear of brown and black migrants and them being eating your pets. It, it, it's gone so far that you can't imagine it being a part of a Republican Party even 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah, this used to be, yeah, I would say that this used to be the conspiracy mongering people on the far right that were sort of on the outskirts of the party, but they were never enabled to become the mainstream. And I would say now we've got the complete opposite, right? Now we've got the same non-mega Republicans who are on the outskirts that have basically been kicked out of the party. And the conspiracies and the embracement of these white nationalists are now who are at the head of it, is what I would say. And look, at this all speaks to the great replacement theory, right? The dangerous great replacement theory that leads to mass shootings and hate crimes that we've seen across our country. And that's why all of these words matter when you have someone like Donald Trump sitting there and Elon Musk, who has a very large presence in social media, circulating these narratives, including with the natural disaster relief on it, right? He's been out there sort of recirculating these posts 
that are dangerous for people who are actually in crisis, people in need, Americans who are just looking for help. They need the help right now. And all he's doing is undermining it. And I think it's all part of just the way they want to maintain power, right? It's, it's ex exclusion. It's fear. It's undermining of everyone but themselves, except for the people who want to be in full control.